think we have a few technical problems back there. I did tell you that Sham, uh, Sharam is a Christian pastor, and, uh, but he was born in the country of Iran, and his family immigrated to the U.S. Uh, when he was seven, and he came to a realization later in life that Christianity is true and Islam is not. So now he's on fire for the Lord, and he explains what the difference is between Christianity and Islam. And uh, as the, the topic is Chrislam exposed, there are movements w even within Christianity to try to say that Christianity and Islam worship the same God. Allah and Jehovah are the same God. And the purpose of Sharam's talk tonight is to expose that as a lie, and he'll explain why. So as soon as they figure out that, uh, come on up. Okay, let's give him an introduction. All right, you guys can hear me okay? So I can hear myself, that's always a good sign. Although some people don't want to hear me. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, that introduction. And um, just on the screen there, because... Be it, we're a little bit tight for time tonight. Uh, I just have a little bit about my background that you can look at. And as Heinz mentioned, uh, coming from Iran and uh, becoming a believer in Jesus Christ 15 years ago, uh, I'm going to be talking tonight uh, during this uh, presentation a little bit about my testimony. So I'll be kind of interweaving uh, my testimony in and out of this because it's obviously uh, my story and it's, it's uh, what uh, is real to me and what God did in my life, what the Lord did. Um, just a little bit about my background is also as far as being a pastor. I've been a pastor now for 13 years. I uh, currently pastor a church in South Everett. Uh, we're going to be actually starting another church uh, out in Spokane Valley here soon that's connected with the Truth and Love uh, ministry, uh, both with the Till Project, which is what uh, uh, the ministry that I travel and speak with, but also our church, Truth and Love Christian Fellowship. Um, some of you <clears throat> may remember last time I was here at uh, I Tell Me Free Lutheran, was when I was actually running for governor. And some of you may remember uh, that I ran for governor, and that was an amazing experience. Um, uh, we, we, we prayed that more people would have stood up with us, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, but God has a plan, and he opened up many doors. So um, I want to just tell you a little bit before we go into the presentation about our ministry, the Till Project. It's a very simple mission to speak the truth in love. It's what we're commanded to do. And today, more than ever, it's critical, I believe, because... Um, it's getting harder and harder for us, particularly as Christians, to speak the truth in love. And I think for the next generation, it's going to get even harder. We're going to have to empower the next generation to have that much more of a backbone and, and, and desire to obey God and, and remain and abide in Christ more than ever. Because uh, I, what I'm seeing is that some of the greatest fire sort of attacks against me are coming from other Christians are coming from within the church community because I am now not loving and I'm now you know, too judgmental and, and too fundamentalist and uh, all because I want to follow the Word of God. So it's amazing where we're at. Uh, by the way, if you find the verse in the Bible that allows us to be politically correct, please email that to me. I have not found that verse yet. So we're, I'm still looking, uh, but um, I, I doubt that it's going to be there. Uh, we are commanded to speak the truth in love. And by the way, remember the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 4, it is so that we're not like little children, tossed about by the waves and by the trickery of men and the scheming that is around us. And I think there's great deception uh, through our ministry. Now, um, just a couple of DVDs that I want to talk about, as Heinz mentioned. We do have um, a DVD that I've done on the true goal of Islam, the, some of the foundational ideology of Islam and Sharia law. That's on the back table. They're available. I have another DVD that I did on restoring our uh, constitutional republic, what kind of a foundation we had. And if we have any chance in this nation of turning anything around, if God is not central to that, then we have no chance because that's the way it was built. We must have a foundation that is on God and on his principles as a nation. Uh, and then lastly, the DVD tonight, or the, the presentation tonight, is on DVD. Uh, this is going to be like drinking from a fire hydrant for some of you, so we're going to go through very fast, but there's more information on the DVD. 
And there's also some special features that include my testimony. I have a testimony of two other former Muslims who've come out of Islam. Uh, I highly would recommend you getting this and getting it into the hands of your pastors, your mission leaders. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about is the prevalent worldview now. Myself, I'm like a dinosaur in the missions community because I will not compromise on the issues that we're going to be talk talking about tonight. They're looking at me like, you know, you're backwards. You, you're, not, you're not moving forward with the program. You just got to get with the program. And you will see that some of these things, uh, there is no room for compromise. So I highly encourage that. Now, I want to get into the presentation because we got to get, get moving. Three verses that I want to share with you. Number one, the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy. I believe this is so true. If not today, I don't know when. <laughs> for the time will come when they, now remember the they is the believers, right? That's the, he's talking to the believers. For they, the Christians, will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance for their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Folks, I am personally seeing this happen at an alarming rate. We know it's going to happen, but it's happening at a faster rate than I thought. But you, who's that? Who's that? That's us. You, us. We who are alert and awake to what's happening, we're supposed to be, supposed to be sober in all things, uh, enduring hardship, doing the work of an evangelist, and fulfilling our ministry. Jesus himself in Matthew 24 warned us also that see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And of course, the greatest admonition in regards, I think, to this presentation tonight, and I think that this is a dialogue that's going to have to change in the church. I don't think we're properly labeling Islam. I don't think we're properly dealing with Islam. In fact, we're going in the absolute wrong direction with Islam. Rather than understanding what Islam is and the ideology of Islam, now I'm not talking about individual Muslims. You can't blanket all Muslims. Just like today, if you say in America, I'm a Christian, what does that mean? I hope you would ask some follow-up questions. What kind of a Christian are you? Do you believe in the inerrancy of the Word of God? Do you believe that we are to obey His commands? Do you believe that Jesus is the only way? I've talked to so-called Christians who don't believe He's the only way. I have to remind them lovingly that you're not a Christian. I'm sorry, a Christ Christian is a follower of Christ, right? But we're too afraid to say those things because we don't want to offend anybody. Well, I think it's time that we start offending some people. Because if we love them, we risk speaking the truth and love to them, which may offend them, but it may just offend them to the truth. So, in the re regards to Islam specifically, why are we not talking about it? Look at what 1 John said. In the New Testament, there are four times that the word Antichrist is used. Three times in 1 John, once in 2 John. Now, it's, the Antichrist is talked about probably over 70 times in Scripture, roundabout, but four times specifically the term Antichrist is used in the New, in New Testament. And one of them here is in 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Look at what it says. Beloved, that's us, right? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, I don't know about you, that's pretty serious. If only four times the word Antichrist is used in the entire New Testament, and every reference to the word Antichrist in the New Testament that you see in these four references is that, anti, against. It's not one who's coming to mimic Christ in these verses. It is the opposite. Because what is it saying? You believe Jesus is God and has come as the Son of God and in the flesh, you're from God. If you believe that He has not come in the flesh, you're of the spirit of Antichrist. Pretty clear? Of which you have heard that is coming and now it is already in the world. Now, there's a reason I'm prefacing that with this verse tonight. Because when we talk about apologetics, when we talk about defending our faith, we have to understand that we're obviously dealing also with spirit. It's spiritual. It's demonic. 
And the problem we have with Islam today is that the Christians and the missionaries and the pastors and the churches are turning Islam to like a buddy system. Let's just give Islam a big hug and we can just love Muslims that way. And what we don't understand is we're dealing with a demonic spirit that is the spirit of Antichrist. And I hope you'll see that tonight in the presentation. What is Chris Lom, first of all? We're going to expose Chris Lom, and we're going to expose, more importantly, the seductive lie. And the reason I said seductive is because it is very tempting to go down this road of believing that we have a common ground with Islam, common God, common word, and particularly um, that we can share sort of a future together and have peace and reconciliation and uh, you know, just get along and everything will be fine. It is um, not only a pipe dream, it is dangerous, deeply dangerous to the faith of Christians and to the salvation of Muslims. If we really love Muslims, then what, what this stuff is, is so, so destructive to their chance of coming to salvation, and it is going to lead Christians astray. Christian, I've already seen it. Christians are being led astray. And we're going to get more Christians converting to Islam. You'll see if we don't get our act together. Now, what is Chris Long? Real quick, two claims. Number one claim, they have a common word. Those who say that Islam and Christianity, because remember, Chris Long, the idea of Chris Long is sort of a hybrid. Many church leaders will say, will, will deny using the term Chris Long. And they're right, they haven't used the term Chris Long. But they will claim that there is common ground, a common word. And we're going to look at a document here just in a few minutes. So number one claim is the Bible and the Quran both are equal in authority or both have authority, meaning they uh, are divinely inspired. Now, quick question for you. Get your apologetics brains on for a second, right? If something is divine truth, what percentage of accuracy must it be? 100%, very good. Because we believe in absolute truth, right? That's a foundation of Scripture. Part of what you see in the postmodern world and in the postmodern church with a lot of the emergent church movement is now they must strike the inerrancy of the Word of God. In order to get along with the culture and reach the secular culture, we must not so much focus on absolutes. Well, if we don't have absolutes, we have no faith. You might as well throw it all in the garbage. Because either God is or He isn't. Either Christ is the Messiah or He isn't. So therefore, in this case, if the Bible, we believe, is the divine Word of God that is in, in, inerrant in its original language, in its original context, that means the Quran to be divine, their supposed holy book of Islam, must also have absolute truth. Must be 100% true. Agreed? If there are lies in that book, if there are contradictions, then you and I have to come to the conclusion one is absolutely true and one is absolutely from the pit of hell. Agreed? No middle ground, right? You're now way ahead of most of the church just by what you agreed upon. Because most of the church believes that there's a middle ground. And this is where we're heading. This movement towards this one world God and one world religion and one world belief system. And let's just, you call God Jehovah and we say Allah, which is, by the way, the next claim, the claim that they're the same God. You know, what does it matter? We say God, you say God, who cares? Let's just get along. Oh, I beg to differ. God cares. So we've got to look at these two claims. And we're going we're gonna to refute these. Now, there are two subtenants, before I get into kind of where it started, there are two subtenants I want to quickly cover with you. And that is that some will say there is a common love of God between Islam and Christianity. We're going to refute that. And there's a common love of neighbor between Islam and Christianity. We're going to refute that. But the two major claims are these ones that I put on the screen here and that we have to refute. So, where does it start? Well, the, the compromise of the gospel of Jesus Christ has happened since the beginning of the gospel, right? But specifically, we've seen it in the last generation, generation and a half, in places like Africa. And in the DVD, I show you a little clip of a, of a so-called church, a Chrislamic congregation in Nigeria. Nigeria used to be predominantly Christian. It was a Christian nation. As Islam has gained the upper hand in Nigeria, and now they're about 50-50, there's been much fighting and much war. So people have come along and said, we have the solution. Let's make peace. Let's have co-services together. Let's have a service where we have the Quran and we have the Bible and we yell Allah Akbar and we supposedly do worship to Jesus Christ and let's just all get along. And some of you like me are going, excuse me? <laughs> 
I would pray that if you and I walked into a church where they had an imam and the Quran was being taught, that we'd turn around and first of all we'd warn about 10, 20, 30 people around us and then we leave. The problem is that's not happening because most Christians have no discernment today because we have too much milk in the church and we're not being taught the Word of God. Therefore, we're not discerning the spirits. Remember what 1 John said? Test the spirits. We're supposed to be testing. We're supposed to be judging. We're supposed to be discerning. And the greater the deception comes, we have to be ready for it. Now, it doesn't just stay in Africa, uh, in countries like Nigeria, where you see this common bond. It's coming to Europe. Uh, as Heinz was talking about the multiculturalism effort, Europe was perfect for that. We're going to be multicultural. We're going to live side by side with Muslims, and we're going to get along. Well, the problem is the Muslims don't want to live side by side. Islam teaches that it must segregate and eventually gain the upper hand. That's what Islam teaches. That's the ideology of Islam. That's the long-term goal of Islam. So when we talk about what is Chrislam, I want you to understand this, that from Europe, it is now into America. And if it's in America, it's in the world. Because our churches, are, we are still the greatest purveyor of the gospel in this nation, even though we're in deep trouble as a nation, America still supports financially, uh, and to some extent, I mean, there's, nation, there's other nations per capita that are sending more missionaries, but we are still a great purveyor of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if it's infecting our churches here in America, you know it's around the world, and vice versa. So let's look at what the source of Chrislam really is, because it's not Nigeria, and it's not somebody's made-up idea. It's from the source that is the Qur'an. Now remember, the Qur'an is what? The Qur'an is believed to be the inspired word of their God, Allah, that was supposed to be dictated word for word to Muhammad. Muhammad, who goes into a cave, and according to his own words, believed that he was possessed by a demon, and he was actually going to go commit suicide. He said, woe to me, and he went on a cliff and he was going to commit suicide because he believed he was demon-possessed. This is the prophet of 1.6 billion people. He claims that he gets these revelations from this angel who later he claims was the angel Gabriel. So when Muhammad got the revelation, the claim is that the Quran is the dictated word of Allah, word for word, in perfect Arabic. The problem is, if you look at the Quran and the source of Quran, you find other words other than Arabic. You find lots of contradictions. You find lots of misinformation. You find lots of places where they try to quote the Bible and they get facts wrong. How about this one? Did you know that the Quran teaches that the legitimate son of Abraham was Ishmael? And that Ishmael was going to be sacrificed in Mecca? Did you know that? You go, oops, that's kind of a big detail, isn't it? Isaac was supposed to be the legitimate seed. They say Ishmael, and we go, oh, it's a common book. No, you're going to see that that's their intent. Their intent from the very beginning, the intent of the enemy in inspiring Islam is to refute Jesus Christ. It's to deny the very deity and function of Jesus Christ. And what better way to deny Jesus Christ than deny the lineage of Jesus Christ? You see, if Isaac was not the legitimate seed, there is no Messiah, right? There is no Messiah, because the Messiah came from the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not from the lineage of Ishmael. So you go, well, why would the Quran want to do that? Well, it goes back to its fundamental purpose, that Abraham, or uh, I'm sorry, Muhammad believes that he was given revelation because he was to refute the people of the book. You go, who are the people of the book? Christians and Jews. So when it says here in Surah 3, 4, O oh, people of the book, come to a common word between us and you. You go, wow, look at that. They're reaching out to us. They, they want us to come to a common word between Islam and Christianity. How wonderful. Let's sit down and have coffee and look at the common word. And then look what it says. That we worship none but Allah and that we associate no partners with Him and none of us shall take others as lords beside Allah. Anybody want to guess what they're saying there? You Christians, you people of the book, stop believing that God was three. Stop believing in the Trinity. Stop believing that Jesus is God. Cut it out. So listen, let's come to a common word so we can correct you. How can you have a common word dialogue if one is trying to correct the other? Does that make any sense? And yet this is the basis 
with which many churches in America today are operating to try to reach out to Islam. Surah 3.4. Now, I want you to notice I underlined that, that, that word there, come to a common word between us and you. It's very important because that didn't just stay in the Quran. This is a tactic of Islam. Now, you go, well, how, how, how is it getting into America? How is this really infiltrating our nation? We know it was in Africa. Okay, we see it in Europe, but it's not really happening in America, right? Wrong. So, in 2006, a group of 138 Muslim scholars come together and write a letter. And they write a, write, write a letter to the Christian community saying, we want to come together and seek peace and harmony and, and hold hands. And, oh, by the way, um, we, 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 you know, we got some issues with you Christians, and we really think you need to ask us for forgiveness because you've done some wrong to us. But we really believe we can reconcile. We can reconcile Islam and Christianity together. And if we do that, we're going to be good to go. We're going to have peace. We're going to get along. We're going to do great things in the world. You want to guess what the letter was called? A common word between us and you. You go, gosh, where did they get that idea from? Surah 364. In fact, they cite Surah 364, but they put it in there instead of saying, we worship none but Allah, they say, we worship none but God. Ha ha. Anybody picking up what the tactic is? We worship none but God. So you and I as Christians go, oh, you're right, we worship none but God. No, 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 that's not what it says in the language. We worship none but Allah, and we associate no partners with him. Well, there's a big difference there. They also went on, as I said, to say, look, we need to have reconciliation. Now, in 2008, at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, they draft a response. And this, this is the response right here up on the screen. It's called a common word. You notice that forward, it's forwarded by Tony Blair, former prime minister of Great Britain, who's a known globalist, who's been known... Um, uh, very well known in the ecumenical, you know, one sort of, you know, let's all, you know, multi-faith, let's all get along, uh, whole movement. And in 2008, Yale drafts a response called Loving God and Neighbor Together, a Christian response to a common word between us and you. And the Christians uh, who supposedly signed this document agree that, yes, number one, we should be focusing on reconciliation. Anybody have a problem with that? Reconciling Islam and Christianity. The 1,400 years that Islam has been around, apparently there was just a few misunderstandings. If we just get those misunderstandings right, we'll be good to go and we're going to have peace moving forward. And I know maybe you're thinking like me, you go, who would fall for this? The question is, who hasn't fallen for it? Do you hear what I'm saying, folks? Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you hear what I'm saying? Who hasn't fallen for it? The majority are falling for this. So then, after the saying we reconcile, we want to reconcile, they'll, the Christians say in the letter, and by the way, I'll, I'll give you the link in a minute, you can go read it for yourself, don't take my word. The Christians say in the letter, we ask the all-merciful one for forgiveness. You go, where in the Bible does it ever use the term all-merciful one? Nowhere. God is a God of mercy, but you'll never see those three words together in the Bible, the all-merciful one. Guess what? You see it all over the place in the Quran. In almost every verse of the Quran, when Muslims are commanded to say the Bismillah prayer, they'll say the words, the all-merciful Allah, the all-merciful one. So the Christians go to the Muslims and say, you're right, we want to ask the all-merciful one for forgiveness. And you know what they ask for forgiveness for? Two things, the Crusades and the war on terror. Now, if you know anything about the Crusades, you know that Islam was in Europe way before the Crusades. And if it was not for the Battle of Tours, the Battle of Poti in 732, Europe would have been under Islamic rule way before the Crusades ever happened. But the textbooks today in most of our public schools paint the picture that Muslims were the defenders and us Christians were the attackers. We were the oppressors. We, were the, we went on the offensive in the Crusades, which was not a, the quite exact accurate history of the Crusades, right? But the folks who put this together say, please forgive us. Now, you go, well, nobody really would sign this, right? Who would, in their right mind, sign this? How about five of the, 500 of the major leaders that most people would recognize, like Pastor Rick Warren, Pastor Bill Hybels, Robert Schuller, John Stott, who I started in Bible college, Leith Anderson, president of the National Association of Evangelicals, the, most of the staff at Fuller Theological Seminary, almost every major emergent church leader in America signed this document or is behind this document. As I said to you folks, most of the church is behind this. 
It is those of us who are not behind it, we're in the minority now. I just want you to understand what we're up against. And you notice that when these leaders signed it, they didn't just stop at signing it, they're now promoting it. People attack me all the time. How dare you criticize Rick Warren? He's a brother in the Lord. Well, listen, Mr. Warren signed this document. I believe every pastor and every leader that signed this document is in grave error. I believe they need to publicly repent. I don't care how big their ministries are. I don't care if you've been on Oprah. You've written five billion books. You've inaugurated the president. I don't care. You know, personally, I don't live for that. I live to please the Lord. And I believe as Christians, we are called to call out falsehood, to call out lies. And these, these are the people that put their names in the document. I didn't sign it for them. They signed it. I have a good friend of mine, Walid Shubat, who um, has, has become a good friend, actually, over the last few months. And um, I talked to Walid about this document, and he said exactly what I felt in my heart. He said, these leaders have covenanted with an antichrist spirit. Remember what I said about 1 John 4? You're going to see tonight what Islam really is. And until we get to the point that we're serious about what Islam really is, we are in deep trouble in America and in the church and as Christians. Because you're seeing the rising of an Antichrist spirit. Okay, so you go, what influence has this common word document had in the churches? Well, in June 2011, we saw a lot of, quote unquote, actually before June of 2011, we saw a lot of interfaith churches. Remember, now the word we use, church, just because someone used the word church doesn't mean it's a church, right? We know that, right? Got to be intelligent enough to know that. Now, the interfaith churches, what does that mean, right? That's the ecumenical movement, right? That's that we believe that you know, all ways lead to God. That's not a Christian church, folks, right? Let's be, let's be very, very honest, but that's not a Christian church. But those churches were promoting this idea of let's, you know, Muslims and Christians and Jews and, and everybody come together and hold hands. And Here's the thing, though, and then now what we see in America, has anybody heard of these tri-faith centers that are being built? They're building these tri-faith centers. One building, Muslims can worship, Christians can worship, Jews can worship. It's going to be a great kumbaya moment. That's happening all over the place. You see congregations like this, Aid Mubarak, Allah blesses you, our dear Muslims and brothers and sisters. Now, on June 26, 2011, there was a more concentrated effort in the more evangelical movement, meaning in churches that were not quote-unquote, interfaith, those churches that claim to be more Christian churches. They believe that Jesus Christ is the way. So on June 26, 9, 2011, they began to promote this idea that we want to have these interfaith uh, Sundays. So they decide to have Korans next to the Bibles and the pews. They're going to focus their Sunday school teachings on um, the teachings of, of the Prophet Muhammad, the five pillars of Islam. Because after all, we just want you Christians to just know a little bit about Islam. That's all. We just want to educate the body on Islam. By the way, some of these churches invited imams to come in and to teach from the Quran. Isn't that, isn't that convenient? So several hundred churches that we know of participated across the country on these uh, Chrislamic Sundays. Now, I call it that. They didn't call it that. They call it an interfaith effort, uh, an effort to reach out and understand our Muslim brothers and sisters. Now, how many churches do you think, or how many mosques, mosques do you think opened their doors and invited Christian pastors to come and teach? Zero. You guys have such little faith. Zero? You're absolutely right. It was zero. We don't know of one mosque that opened their doors to allow a Christian pastor to come in and teach the Bible. Now, there were several mosques that had Ramadan dinners and invited Christians to come and have a Ramadan dinner, but not one opened their door like the Christian churches were and said, oh, we're going to invite a pastor in, open the Bible and teach from the Bible, because I'll, I'll take that invitation. If a mosque said you can come in and teach the word of God, uh, uh, you know, unabated, unabridged, and, you know, no restrictions, I'd take that, that offer. That, that, you know, I'll take that challenge. I may not come out of the mosque, but I'll take that challenge. <laughs> After all, to die is to gain, right? You know, you get to be, go home with the Lord. But here's the thing. You go, why would the mosques not open their doors? What's, what's the problem? How about the fact that they're teaching in the mosques that the Bible is corrupt? So here we're promoting a common word dialogue where we're putting side by, by the way, in that letter, the common word document, they had side by side verses of the Bible and the Quran and look how we have this common ground and common love of God and common love of neighbor. And yet in the mosque, they're teaching, we're not going to have the, the Christians come in because the, the Bible is corrupted. The prophet of Islam said that the whole reason that he's, he brought the Quran is as the final revelation. 
So who's being bamboozled? Us Christians. We perish for a lack of our knowledge because we lack vision and we lack understanding and we lack understanding of our enemy. We're not operating as wise as serpents and gentle as doves. We're trying to be gentle as doves and we're not operating wise as serpents. And I don't even think the gentle as doves is really true, the true gentleness that Christ demonstrated because we have now have false love. This idea that let's just love everybody. It's just all about love. What is your definition of love, I would ask? Just, you know, FYI. You go, okay, well, where does it, how far does this go? How far, um, how locally do we see that? For example, here's a church in Tacoma, Washington. Life Center Tacoma. It's supposed to be an evangelical church, although if you know more about their history, you know that they've been going down the road of the emergent church movement for many years. But 6,500 members in this church. And last November, their pastor here, Dean Curry, now the reason I'm saying his name, I publicly call him out, because I publicly met with him, or, or I privately met with him. And I privately confronted him. And he has told me that there was no error in bringing Imam Musavi from Iran into his Sunday services. And having Imam Musavi have a Quran in his hand and open the Quran and teach about Jesus in the Quran. And people were tweeting, what an amazing day for Jesus. Hashtag unity. Amazing here, Imam Musavi from Iran speak today about Jesus at Life Center Tacoma, hashtag Jesus, hashtag common ground. How many believers were in that church that are ignorant and did not know and are being deceived by their pastor? And that pastor was invited to come to one of my presentations. He did. He heard the same message that I'm giving you before you tonight. And then myself and another former Muslim from Iran went and met with him. Two witnesses to one. And we brought this to his attention. Pastor, we believe this is grave error. You've brought great confusion into the church. Nope, there was no error. Pastor, are you going to teach your body about Islam? Nope, they don't need to know about Islam. They just need to know about Jesus. Well, wait a second. Why did you bring this imam in and teach him about the false Jesus? And the few people in that church who were alert and awake, who went to their leadership and confronted, exercised Matthew 18 to their leadership, they were asked to leave because they're troublemakers. This is the state of many of our so-called churches. Six and a half thousand people in three locations of Life Center Tacoma. This isn't just an ecumenical movement anymore, folks. This is mainstream evangelical Christianity that is now beginning to go down this road in order to love Muslims. We need to love Islam. We need to understand Islam. No, you don't. You can love Muslims and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them without embracing Islam. In fact, it's the opposite. We should be resisting Islam because Islam is the ideology. It is demonic. It is spiritual. The Muslim is the victim of Islam. The Muslims themselves are victims. And don't forget that probably more than 50% of Muslims in America are agnostic. They don't even know what their own ideology is. Just like many Christians who've never read the Bible. So there's three things we have to review. refute. We've got to move on. Remember, the number one claim is that the Bible and the Quran are common word, right? Let's, let's, let's refute that very quickly. This is what I focus on. Jesus is the word. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and it goes on to say, nothing was created without Him. The foundational belief is that not only is the Bible, as Paul says in 2 Timothy, Scripture that is God-breathed, inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training. Not only is the Bible that, and not only do we obviously as Christians believe that God inspired through the apostles, particularly the New Testament, that, that was canonized through them, but we believe Jesus himself is the Word. That means if you don't like parts of the Bible, you have a problem with Jesus, folks. Because he said, if you love God, first commandment, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Second commandment, to love your neighbor. If you love God, if Jesus if you love me, you will obey my commands. Amen? So Jesus is the Word, and all Scripture is God-breathed. That means in its original manuscript, Scripture is inerrant. Amen? Is that not a foundational belief of our Christian faith? But yet you talk to Christians out there and you ask them that question and they'll go, well, but you know, I mean, really, all of the Bible? You, be you believe some of those stories in the Bible? 
What does the Quran say? Now, I could spend hours talking about different verses from the Quran. We're going to look at one later, but I want to show you this verse from the Quran and what it claims about the Bible. You go, well, they're not talking about the Bible. Sure they are. Look what the first line is. Say, O people of the Scripture. So who are they talking to? That's you and I. Now, my advice to you always is don't take the advice. Got it? Don't take the advice. But I just want to share with you, what are they saying to us Christians? Do not exceed limits in your religion beyond the truth, and do not follow the inclinations of a people who had gone astray before and misled many, saying to you and I, the Christians, don't follow what the Christians before said. All of that nonsense about Jesus dying on the cross and, and being the Son of God and coming in the flesh and the Trinity, all of that stuff is nonsense. Don't follow their leading, Christians. I have a question for you, though. If the Quran and its main purpose is not to bring unity, its main purpose is to disprove Christianity, how can we have a common word? How can there be any commonality? Is that not just make sense? Just for a moment, forget faith. Just put your logic head on for a minute, okay? Does that not make sense that if one document is clearly refuting the other document that there not only is not a common word, but you and I have to choose one is from God and one is from the enemy. Is that a fair statement? Is that a fair apologetic statement? But yet we see the opposite happening. Despite the evidence, I think most of those pastors who signed that common word document didn't even bother reading the Quran. Maybe they should have talked to a few more former Muslims who have come out of Islam and said, what do you think? Should we sign this document? Because I would have told them, never. Never, pastor. Don't ever put your name to that document. But oh, it's about peace and harmony. It's about us getting along. No, it's about us being led down the road of deception and deceit and the trickery of men, which is what Ephesians 4 says, right? And if we're in that place, then you and I are operating not as mature believers, folks, but as little children that are easily tossed about by every wind of doctrine. So very clearly, and again, I'll show you another verse later, but I want to move on from this point. There is, there's just not even, it's not even worth my breath to go any further. Very clearly, there can be no common word. It is impossible for there to be a common word. Every story that Muslims will say, oh, but there's, there's stories in the Quran about the Bible. No, no, no. Those stories are taken out of, out, of, out of order. The stories have wrong details. Let me give you one more example really quick. In Surah 345, it talks about the birth of Jesus, or Esau. Esau in the Bible. It says Esau was born to Mary. Mary was a virgin. You go, wow, look, we have a common word. Then it goes on to say, Mary, who was the, the brother, or the, I'm sorry, Mary, who was the sister of Aaron. Anybody tracking with me? Mary, the Mary of, 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 of the time of Jesus, the mother of Jesus, who was the sister of Aaron. Who was Aaron? The brother of Moses. What kind of time frame was there between Moses and Jesus? Exactly. Whoops. Right? You're, are you tracking with me? S small detail or big detail? Kind of a big detail, right? How does a book get those things wrong? Because it's from the pit of hell. It's not of God. Number two claim. Oh, by the way, this is one of the reasons why Muslims will claim that the... Just getting warmed up, so I hope you're... <laughs> We don't do this one hour thing, you know, we're like, you know, getting into, okay, so the Quran teaches that there were seven major prophets. Anybody want to guess who the seventh prophet is? Muhammad. Who was number six? Jesus or Esau. They claim Esau. So Esau comes, his followers completely corrupt everything he stood for because Esau is simply a prophet of Allah. Now Allah has to send Muhammad to correct us. And yet, Muhammad believed he was demon-possessed. I'm sorry, did you find one prophet in the Bible who was believed when he had a visitation from God that he was possessed? Anybody? Can you find one prophet in the Bible who literally wanted to go commit suicide because he thought that he was hearing from a demon? And yet, this is the history. And most Muslims, by the way, are not even allowed to, to question their own ideology. 
If they do, they're taught that Allah will send them to hell. That's convenient, isn't it? So, number two claim. And this is the major claim, really. Because the common word claim is easy to, to, to debunk. That's easy. That's just ridiculous. Those who want to exercise the common word dialogue, they're in two camps. They're either deceived or they're deceivers. There's no other option. They're either deceived themselves, meaning they're being bamboozled into believing that it's a common word, or they are deceivers. They themselves are participating in the deception. They know exactly what they're doing. There is no middle ground. Because even if, you see, when I talk to fundamentalist Muslims, devout fundamentalist Muslims, they will say, we don't have a common ground. The Quran clearly refutes the Bible. You're wrong. They tell you the truth. And I appreciate that. I, I tell those Muslims, thank you at least for telling me the truth. This is a harder one to disprove because many missionaries are saying it's no big deal, and I'll tell you why in a minute. First of all, what does the Bible say about Jehovah God? Well, we know that you can't worship other gods, right? That we are commanded to worship Him and Him alone. Why? Well, here's Exodus 34 that says, He is a jealous God. He's jealous for His name. Well, now, if God says I'm jealous for my name, I take that seriously. I don't know about you. I kind of take that seriously. And has He not given us His name? He has told us who he is. Jehovah, Yahweh, Elohim, over 2,000 times in the Bible. El Shaddai, Adonai. What about all the names? I, I named my first son after Jehovah Jireh. God is our provider, right? He has given us his names, his attributes. I beg to ask you, why did one time he not say, my name is Allah? Because he actually warned us of the opposite. He said, do not worship false gods and do not worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. Hang on to that. We're going to visit that in just a minute here. Number two, the Bible says that the God of the Bible is a God of love. Amen? This is critical. Look what 1 John says, right? Beloved, love one another, for love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God, knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By the way, that word love, look it up in the original Greek, it is agape love. It is not filial love. It's not the give me a big warm fuzzy hug. It is the commitment love that Christ made even unto death for you and I. I'm sure so, so glad he was committed. I'm sure glad that he didn't compromise last minute. Amen? Whoops, come back. So God should be worshipped alone. God is a God of love. How about this one? There's no lie in God. This is critical, right? There's no lie in God. Numbers, oh, get back here. Numbers 23, for God, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Has he spoken and will he not make it good? Numbers 23. Now, why is it so critical that God does not lie? I, I asked you a question. How do you know you're saved? Well, the inerrancy. You have many examples. For example, the testimony of the disciples. That was a big deal for me. When I looked at the gospel, remember, growing up as a Muslim, I wanted to share this with you really quick. It's a quick part of my testimony. Growing up as a Muslim, I was taught that the only guarantee of salvation I had was to die for Allah. In the hadith, there are actually seven blessings that are given to the martyr. One of those blessings is the whole you know, focus on the virgins. But what most people don't talk about is the seventh blessing. When you talk to a Muslim, you ask them, do you believe that... God has atoned for your sin. They say, we don't believe that a man can ever atone for our sin because they don't believe Jesus is God. And they believe that you and I think a man became God. So therefore they say, man, a man could never atone for the sins of, of man. Not possible. I go, well, you're, then, you don't, uh, then you're not a good Muslim. They go, what? I go, you're not a good Muslim. And I go, you have no guarantee of salvation. They go, what? I go, what is, and I go to the verse out of the Hadith which I won't cover in this presentation, but it, there's a new presentation I have on Islam that I cover. And I say, the number seven, number seven of the blessings that Allah promises to the shaheed or the martyr, if they die for the sake of Allah, is that that martyr goes into paradise and now intercedes for 70 of their family. That martyr becomes an intercessor and actually gets to go before Allah and say, hey, 70 of my family, let's go. That's why when you see somebody kill themselves as a martyr, as a jihadist, what do the family do? They have a celebration. Have you ever wondered why they do that? Because they believe they now all are going to heaven. It's called collective salvation. Does that make sense? No, but that's what they believe. 
So when they say that, well, let me say it this way. Again, going back to my testimony, when I was taught that, I didn't want to die. I liked life. I wanted to live. So I thought, well, I'm not a good Muslim. And there's no other guarantee. There is no other guarantee. Don't, don't let a Muslim tell you there's no other guarantee. Everything else is a maybe. Even if they go to Mecca for their holy pilgrimage, which we'll talk about in a minute, it's a maybe. Maybe Allah will let you in. The only guarantee is to become the shaheed. That's why I say Islam is a culture of death. Now, why is it important that God not lie? Because we are told, and I was told, that God died for me so I can live for Him. Not that I have to die for Him, but that He has died for me so I can live for Him. And the way He backed it up was not just through the inerrancy of the Word, but through the resurrection, right? We know over 500 witnesses, uh, more than that, were witness to the resurrection. And to me, the evidence that was very strong was the, the, was the disciples themselves. To me, when I looked at the disciples pre-post, I'm like, pre, they're all a bunch of cowards. They all ran and hit. Post, they're going, you can kill us, but we're not going to deny what we've heard and seen. And I'm going, what happened in these guys? What changed? What was it that made them so committed to now become a martyr, not to kill themselves, but to be willing to be died, to be killed for their faith? Is because they saw the risen Christ. So, if the risen Christ was risen, that means everything he said is true. That means that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have eternal hope. Amen? Now, if God lies, how do you trust your eternal hope? How can you trust it? You can't. So what does the Quran say? Who does the Quran say that Allah is? Because the claim today is that we can synonymously use Allah for Jehovah, Jehovah for Allah, no big deal. I mean, I can't tell you how many churches are doing this, how many pastors, how many missions. In fact, if you go to any missions fest, this is now the predominant worldview that we're going to use Allah. We're going to be able to translate Bibles that use Allah. We're going to be able to say uh, that if, if a Muslim becomes a follower of Christ, they can still pray to Allah because Allah is simply Jehovah. It's just their version of God. So who does the Quran or the sources of Islam, or the history of Islam, say Allah is. Well, first of all, Allah, I'm going to make my, make my, my claim, and then I'll, I'll back it up. Allah is actually the root of Allah, the history of Allah, is He was the moon god. And He was specifically the chief god, but He was the specific god of the tribe of Muhammad. So pre-Islam, you have to understand that the region, the Arabic Peninsula, was strife, was like just full of paganism. There was a lot of different elements of pagan worship. And we know that there was Baal worship going on. So now, Allah, who at that time was one of 360 idols, he was the chief idol over the Kaaba, which I'll show you a picture in a minute, and so he was being worshipped as the chief idol. Muslims today, or even missionaries, will claim that Allah simply means a god in Arabic. This is not true. It means the God, derived from the word Al-Ilah, the God. You go, well, why is that so critical? Because he was the God of the Kaaba. Pre-Islam, he was being worshipped as the God of the Kaaba. In fact, the Kaaba was referred to as Ba'at Allah, or the house of Allah. So pre-Muhammad, he's being worshipped as the chief God, the chief generic God over 360 idols. Remember, 360 because they were, you know, going back to the historical calendar, one idol for each day of the year. So they were worshiping these 360 idols. Allah was a generic God. Muhammad comes on the scene, believes he gives a revelation that he must end polytheism. And so therefore, he supposedly comes and says, now we are going to destroy all the other idols, but he conveniently keeps one. By the way, this happened at the end of his ministry. Because at the beginning of his, I even shouldn't even call it ministry. At the beginning of his life, when he supposedly gets the revelation, for 13 years, he's proselytizing in Mecca. He gets about, if I, if I give him a lot of credit, he gets about 150 followers, depending on what source you look at. It is when he moves to Medina, after he had married a wealthy woman, he had become, become a warlord, he was committing political assassinations, he was doing raids on the caravans, getting money and booty and slaves, and he moves to Medina. In Medina, he actually, according to the Hadith himself, 
drives out two tribes of Jews, and one tribe of Jews called the Banu Karaiza are there in Medina. They're massacred by Muhammad. The Quran says it was called the Battle of Trenches, or some say the Battle of Kaibar, and that they came in there and Muhammad supervised the beheadings of six to 900 Jews that were then summarily dumped into a ditch that was dug around Medina. This is what the Prophet of Islam did himself. So today, when the President of the United States and every other top leader says, ISIS is not Islam, you should know that they are operating in Takiya, which is lying, which is propaganda for the American citizens. I don't believe they're ignorant, folks. I don't believe that anymore. Everything that ISIS is doing, the Prophet of Islam did. And the successing, the successors, the caliphs that followed him. So now... Muhammad from, Me uh, from Medina makes a treaty with Mecca. But he breaks that treaty like he did in every battle that he went into. And he comes back into Mecca, he routes Mecca, he kills many Meccans, and he goes into the Kaaba, he wipes out all the idols, but he happens to keep one idol. And he says, this idol now is the true God. His name is Allah. But you go, wait a second, what was the specific name? If Allah was a generic name, what was the specific name of the tribe of Muhammad? The, the, the tribe of Muhammad, the Quraysh, were worshiping a specific god. What was the specific name of that god? Well, they happened to worship Hubal or Hu Baal. And Hu Baal was now specifically the moon god. How many of you know in the Bible that Baal worship or Baal was representative with the moon? And that Ashtara, the female of the Baal, was representative with the star, the heavens, the stars, the moon and the stars. That's why God said, don't worship the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. There was a reason he said that. What is the symbol of Islam today? The moon and the stars. You go, well, where would they get that? Because of the root of Islam, it was Baal worship. From the very foundation of Islam, it was Baal worship. Allah was the chief pagan god of pre-Islam. And Muhammad comes on and says, let me tell you, he's now the one true god. And we're going to call him Allah. So missionaries will today say, there's no problem for a Muslim or a Christian missionary in reaching out to a Muslim using the term Allah. There's no problem. They'll go in, I've had some tell me and email me and correct me, try to correct me and say, you know what, here's the thing. In, in, in the Arab countries, they can use uh, little Allah and big Allah and they know what they're talking about. Wow, really? So when they see Allah, they know if it's a little Allah or big Allah. They go, oh, well, look, they used to worship Allah pre-Islam. Yes, they did. So why would you and I then come along and say, let's ca call the God of the Bible this? Oh, but they, they all do it. It's okay. Now, remember, first of all, I want to remind you, only 15% of Muslims are Arabs. This is predominantly an Arab issue. 15%. Yeah, we think they're all Arabs, don't we? 15% are only Arabs. In Iran, we don't have this problem because when, when Muslims become Christians, in Iran, we have a generic term for God. It's called Khoda. There's no specific deity associated with it. It's just a generic name. But yet we teach Muslims who have become Christians in Iran, to call on the true name of Jesus Christ. We teach them the names of God. But yet we're told by missionaries in many mission organizations, this is not a problem. We're going to use Allah. And in fact, it's working. You go, really? It's working? What kind of, a, what kind of converts are you seeing? You're going to see later that many of these so-called converts are going back to Islam. The fruit speaks for itself usually. Now, I've got to move on. Do you know that also pre-Islam, the tribe of Muhammad not only worshipped Allah, but they served Allah, they were dedicated to Allah in the Kaaba. Muhammad's father was named Ibdi Allah, which means Abdullah or slave of Allah. So how can Muhammad come and introduce the monotheistic one true God to the world if this is who they were worshiping? You see, here's the argument that I make with missionaries. And this is where this, is, this has got to be our apologetic arguments to anybody who says this. Because Muhammad has revealed Allah. Even if Allah, even if I gave them the claim that Allah was just a generic name for, a, for God... Muhammad has come on the scene, and for 1,400 years, the Quran has taught us who Allah is. So now we know who Allah is. 
So now, if I'm calling the true God Allah, I'm referring to the Allah of the Quran. Does that make sense? How do I distinguish in my mind that it's not the same Allah? This doesn't make any sense to me. So therefore, I am being told now, Sharam, you need to get with the program. And I'm telling these missionaries, not only will I never get with your program, I will stand in your way. And I will do everything in my power to point out that you're an error, brother and sister in Christ. I will never use Allah to describe the God of the Bible. Never. Never. Because the more you understand, if I had more time, I can go much more into detail the fact that in Mecca today, they still worship a black stone. That corner of the Kaaba right there near the door, there's a black stone there that is encased in silver. And forgive me, I know there's young kids in the room. It looks like the private parts of a woman. And the black stone, I'm done now, the black stone, they go and they, they touch it and they believe that it takes away their sins. You go, why would they believe that? Isn't that idolatry? Yes, but that's what they did pre-Islam. If you track this black stone, you can see that it was a good chance that it was a stone that was talked about with the, queen, with, the, with, the god, with the false god of Artemis when Paul was talking about Artemis. And that this black stone, you know, a stone that fell from heaven was being worshipped. And then in about two, two, uh, the second century AD, it goes missing. And archaeologists don't know where it, where, where it went until it, the next place we see it is now in Mecca. And today they still worship it. In fact, Muslims believe that if they go to that corner and touch that black stone, maybe Allah will let them into heaven. You see, the majority of aspects of worship are still pagan in Islam. And 1.6 billion people are following it, and now many Christians are beginning to also embrace it. Hubal and Allah are one and the same. It is pagan. It is false. It is the moon god. It is demonic, folks. It is the Antichrist spirit. That's why I will never call the true God of the Bible Allah. Now, two other things I want to cover about this Allah. One, did you know Allah is never mentioned as a God of love in the Quran? Not one time is he ever mentioned as a God of love. He's mentioned as the all-merciful one, but never as a God of love. And do you also know that one of the 99 names that is given to Allah in the Quran is that Allah Kairul Makrin. The word Makrin or Al-Makr means deceiver. And the word uh, Kairul means the greatest, the chief, the, the top. So that translates Allah is the chief of the deceivers. He reveled in war. He reveled in war to deceive his enemies. And that's why Muslims are taught this concept of taqiyya or taqiyya. Surah 16 teaches the Muslim that if they are in a non-Muslim country, if they're in a situation where their conscience is being threatened, where their, their risk of their conscience is being threatened, they're permitted to lie to protect their conscience. The opposite of what you and I as a Christian would believe, right? That in order to protect our conscience, we shouldn't lie. Does that sound like the same God to you? So the God of the Bible is a God of love. The God of the Bible says don't worship other gods. The God of the Bible is a God of truth. The God of Islam has roots in paganism, in Baal worship. He's not a God of love. He lies. And he's the chief of liars. Tell me how we're having discussion today that there's a common God. There are many missionaries now that are saying that we believe that Allah is the same as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have big problems ahead of us. Now, real quick, we've got to move on. Real Jesus. There's another argument, right? You see, in the Bible, what does the Bible say about Jesus? He's the son of the living God. I'm not going to read these verses. You can look them up yourself. Jesus is the son of the living God, right? That's a paramount belief as Christians, right? That is a foundational belief that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Amen? Jesus is also fully God, fully man. There's another foundational belief. That he was fully God and became fully man, not the other way around. So when I, sometimes I talk to Muslims, they say, well, you believe a man became God. No, I don't. We believe God came down to earth and became man. They have a hard time with that. You know why? There's two reasons. First of all, you see, in Islam, Allah is so powerful. I'm being facetious. Allah is so powerful that he only speaks one language, and that's Arabic. Now, think about this for a second. Every Muslim is commanded to speak Arabic or at least pray in Arabic. When they do their daily prayers, they're commanded to pray in Arabic. It's got to be classical Arabic. If they're wrong in their prayers, they can get in trouble. 
yet only 15% of Muslims are Arabs. And as Islam grows, Allah has a problem because he can't communicate with his people. The second thing that is very amazing is that Allah is so powerful, once again I'm being facetious, that he can't enter his own creation. It says in the Quran that he is not permitted to enter his creation. That's why they believe that God can never become a man. You see, the true God of the Bible is so powerful that he speaks every language, even languages that you and I may, 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 may not have existed years ago, today exist. He speaks every language of every tribe of every nation. The God of the Bible is so powerful that he can enter his creation whenever he chooses and pleases. Now, I don't know about you, that's the God I want to follow. It's not the same God, but Jesus is fully God, fully man. And of course, we know that the Bible clearly claims that Jesus is the only path of salvation. He is the only way, the way. There's no other way. There can be no other way, because any other way makes him null and void. If the moment that we, you and I believe that there's another way to heaven, that there's another salvation, there's another hope, Jesus' sacrifice becomes useless. Is that not a good apologetics argument? You see logic? We've got to exercise some logic. Because you can't make the claim that he is a savior for some. Because that's not what he claimed. So he's fully God, fully man. Now, what does the Quran teach about this so-called Jesus? Remember the imam that came to that church in Tacoma? The, the, opened the Quran, Jesus is in the Quran, and they gave him a standing ovation. Did you know that? Dear God, help us. The Quran mentions Isa 97 times. But interestingly enough, every time, he is a prophet only. He is a prophet of Allah. In fact, the Quran teaches he's a Muslim. Did you know that? He's a Muslim. Here's another billboard that you see around the world. There are Muslim groups, groups that put these billboards. Here's another one. Jesus, a prophet of Islam. Mypeace.com AU. This is a group, by the way, that is connected to the worldwide Muslim Brotherhood Network. You go, who, who's, who are these billboards for? Muslims? Oh, they're for non-Muslims. For, for Christians who don't know their word. Don't know Islam. They go, did you know Jesus is in the Quran? How wonderful, right? Look, we can have common ground. So they go, Jesus, and you go, well, wait a second. Do you know that the, not only the Jesus, the, the Isa that is in the Quran, not only does he claim to be a prophet, do you know that he vehemently denies that he is God? Look what it says in Surah 572. The Messiah has said, he calls himself the Messiah but it doesn't mean what it means to you and I. The Messiah has said, Indeed, he who associates others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise, and his refuge is the fire. If anybody says that I, the Messiah, am connected with Allah, meaning I'm God, Allah will send you to hell. Is that pretty strong? Is that, is that get across what they're trying to say? And it's not just they, it's the Esau of the Quran who is saying this. So the Esau of the Quran is denying the Jesus of the Bible. First John 4, what did it say? Anyone who denies Jesus is God and come in the flesh is the spirit of the Antichrist. Is there a middle ground on this, folks? Does God have a middle ground? Look what he goes on to say in the same verse. The Messiah calls himself the Messiah again. Son of Mary was not but a messenger. Well, then how could he be the Messiah? If it was just a prophet, did any prophet in the Bible claim that he died for the sins of the world? In fact, what would happen to a prophet in the Bible if he made that claim? He would have been stoned in the Old Testament. Because that's what? Blasphemy. Why were they going to kill Jesus? Same thing. Because he said, when they said, are you the Messiah? He said, I am. Blasphemy. They ripped their clothes apart. They went nuts. Because they knew exactly what he was claiming. But the Esau of the Quran denies. Look at what it goes on to say. And they said, who's they? Those who claim. That God is three. Look what it says. The most, this is the other verse I want you to understand. How vehemently the Isa of the Quran denies the Jesus of the Bible. The most merciful Allah has taken for himself a son. Well, who claims that? Raise your hand, please, if you believe that, not Allah, by the way, God, the true God, has taken for himself a son. That he has a son. Thank you, everyone raise your hand. Okay, that the true God of the Bible has a son. 
Now look what the Quran says about those people who believe that. That's you and me. Assuredly, they utter a hideous thing, whereby almost the heavens are torn apart, and the earth is split asunder, and the mountains fall in ruins. If they associate, it goes on to say, Allah with the sun. Wow, really? You're going to have, a, you're, you're going to have Armageddon, you're going to have disaster and catastrophe if you claim that Allah has a son. Really, Allah, Allah would never take a son. Now here's the bizarre thing. There were early verses in the Quran that said Allah, the Allah of the pagan uh, Allah, remember pre-Islam, had three daughters. Al-Uzza, al al alat and Manat. When Muhammad first got the revelation, those verses were in the Quran. He then claims halfway through his life when he gets the latter verses of the Quran, what's called the abrogated verses, he then claims that he was demon-possessed. Again, that Satan influenced him again. What an amazing prophet of God this guy was that he kept, kept, kept getting possessed by Satan. And so he takes those verses out. And then we see verses like Surah 112 that Muslims pray daily in their prayers. Muslims pray this in their prayers that Allah has no son. They say in Surah 112, Allah is not begotten nor does he beget. That means Allah cannot be a father nor does he have a son. And most Muslims don't even know they're praying this because they have to recite the Arabic in their daily prayers. And they're denying in their daily prayers the God of the Bible. Does that make sense, folks? It doesn't make sense. But you understand? So make sure you understand how serious. Here's a, Quran, or here's a uh, billboard that we're, we've been recently seeing in, in, in the news. This is called whyislam.org from the ICNA. ICNA is the Islamic Circle of North America. They put these billboards in the Bible Belt. Here, this one was in Norcross, Georgia. Find Jesus in the Quran, Surah 345. Now, again, once again, ask you, who's this for? Is this for, for, for Muslims? Or could it be for Christians and agnostics and all the lukewarm people? And they go, look, I'm going to call this number, and I'm going to find Jesus is in the Quran. Hallelujah, right? Wrong. By the way, Surah 345, that's the verse that says, Mary was the sister of Aaron. <coughs> that's the same verse. So let me ask you this. Have I shown you tonight there can be no common word? Have I shown you tonight there can be no common God? Have I shown you tonight not only is there not a common Jesus, the Jesus or the Esau of the Quran denies the very essence and deity of the Jesus of the Bible. It is the Antichrist of the Bible. And let me cover just a few more things that they deny. They deny the Trinity. Muslims will say, us as Christians, we believe in that we're, we're polytheists. They call it mushrikun. We're polytheists because we believe in the Trinity. They think we believe that, we believe that, that um, <laughs> this is not funny, this is sad, but they believe. They think that we believe Joseph was the father, Jesus was the son, and Mary was the mother. That they think that's what we believe in the Trinity. But they believe they deny the Holy Spirit. Now look at this verse from Surah 4. This is the other verse I wanted to cover tonight. And look how powerful this is. Once again, it's talking to Christians. Oh, followers of the book. You get this talking to us, right? Do not exceed limits in your religion and do not speak lies against Allah, but speak the truth. And it goes on to say, say not three. Can it be any clearer what they're saying to us? Desist. It is better for you. Allah is only one God. Far be it from his glory that he should have a son. Test the spirits, folks. Anyone that says that Jesus is not God, is not the Son of God, is not come in the flesh, is once again the spirit of the Antichrist. And we're trying to hug Islam. We're trying to make friends with Islam. We're trying to say that we have common ground. The idea of the Trinity is all throughout Scripture. This is one verse. Of course, we know the word Trinity is not in Scripture. But the idea of the Trinity triune God. Uh, of course we don't believe in three gods, right? Amen? We don't believe in three gods. We believe in the one Godhead, the, the three distinct roles and characteristics of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Islam denies the crucifixion. You go, what? Really? In the Quran itself, it denies the crucifixion? Yes. Surah 4, 1, 5, 7, that they said and boast, those who killed supposedly Jesus, we killed Christ Esau, the son of Mary, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them 
For of a surety they killed him not. You know what the Quran teaches? And the traditions of Islam teach that Allah put Judas on the cross, made, to, made, made, made him look to appear like Jesus, and then Jesus was taken to heaven and is going to return one day, but not as the Messiah, but as the side king. I'll cover that just for you in just a minute here. So wait a second. If they vehemently deny the crucifixion, do we have a Christian faith anymore? No crucifixion, no savior, no Messiah, no Christianity. Boom, game over, right? No crucifixion. How about this? How about the resurrection? No crucifixion, no resurrection, no Christianity. End of Christianity. End of the hope of the world. Oh, but it's a common, we can just hold hands. And... Woe to us if we believe that. Of course, we know in the Bible that Jesus claimed, this is the verse I love with the story of Lazarus, right? That he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Folks, when I came to understand that Jesus was the resurrection, that what I had believed about Jesus in, the, in Islam was a, was a lie. And the true Jesus not only has died, but he's come back to life. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that Jesus gave his life for me so I can live for him. And the, and the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit is in me and in you as Christians. That's the God I want to follow. Islam denies love and friendship to the unbeliever. You go, really? Wait a second. Didn't that common word document say that we have a common love of neighbor? Aha. There's an early verse in the Quran that says, hey, Muslims, take Jews and Christians as friends. You go, wonderful. Wrong. Here's the problem. There are abrogated verses in the Quran. The latter verses that were given to Muhammad. You see, when he starts using the sword, remember I said he had 150 followers? When he starts using the sword, the last 10 years of his life, he gets over 100,000 followers. It's amazing how threats work. Submit to Islam or die. It seems to have a very positive effect, doesn't it? So here's an abrogated verse, O you who have believed. He's talking to the Muslims now. O Muslims who have believed, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. They are, in fact, allies of one another. And the verse goes on to say, you become like one of them. You go, wait a second, which is it, the early verse or the latter verse? What's the answer? It depends. <laughs> if Muslims are not in the upper hand, it's called Dar al-Harb the house of the infidel or the house of war, they are commanded to make friends with their enemies. But once it goes to the Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, and they gain the upper hand, then they are commanded to live by the latter verses. That's why you see two faces of Islam. That's why you see in Nigeria, a friend of mine who in Nigeria who lived with Muslims in their neighborhood, played soccer together, they were best friends. But when Islam gained the upper hand, those same Muslims came and burned his house down. Because they would not, his family would not convert to Islam. They were run out of their neighborhood and their house was burned down. You go, well, which, which Islam is it, folks? It's both. The early verses to suck us in, the latter verses when they gain the upper hand. Does that make sense? This is a latter verse. There is no common love of neighbor in Islam when they gain the upper hand. How about the fact that Islam denies Isaac is a legitimate seed? I already covered that with you. Here, of course, is the verse from Genesis that said Isaac was a legitimate seed. That's huge, right? That they say Ishmael was a legitimate seed. And lastly, I've saved the best for last, not really. Islam denies that Jesus Christ is going to return as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Remember how I said that they believe Jesus went up to heaven? Or Esau? Well, they believe that he's going to return. But he's not going to return by himself. He's going to return as a second in command. You go, well, who's first in command? The Mahdi. Anybody hear about the Mahdi? Now, Shiite Muslims will say 12th Imam. The Sunnis will believe, both believe in the Mahdi. The Mahdi is a figure that for them is the Messiah. In fact, in eschatology in Islam, if you look at their eschatology, they believe the Mahdi will come in. Now, pay attention, please, really quick. Okay, you're paying attention. I'm going to burst the bubble of some people here in their eschatology worldview. Just kind of throwing out there just to think about it. They believe the Mahdi will come and usher in a seven-year period of peace. And that at some point during that, just like Muhammad did, he'll break that peace treaty and he will then establish Islam. You go, hmm. And Revelation talks about the beheading of the saints. Hmm. 
Islam is an antichrist spirit. Hmm. Just thinking, just think. I'm just saying, just think. But here's what it says in the Hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari is one of the Hadith. These are the extracurricular uh, books that are written about the Prophet of Islam. Just really quick, I got to get you to understand this. The Quran is one source. Then they have the Hadith and the Sirah. That's called the Sunnah. The Hadiths and the Sirah are basically the biography of Muhammad. It's what he did, what he said, how he acted, how he behaved. 86% of all of the texts of Islam is about Muhammad. Why? Because nobody else got the revelation. It's on him. You either believe Muhammad or you don't. There's no middle ground. You've got to either believe he is who he is or you've got to believe that he was demon-possessed. I personally believe what he believed. He was demon-possessed. So, 86%. Got it? Now, the Hadiths are extra, but Muslims are commanded in ni over 93 verses in the Quran, they're commanded to imitate the Prophet. What he did, they're supposed to follow. That's why when people say ISIS is not Islamic, you go, what are you, what are you on? I was going to say something else, I apologize. What are you on? What, what, what lie are you feeding us? Because here's the thing, they're supposed to imitate Muhammad. So you go, well, what is, what, what, what is this Esau going to do? Esau is going to return. What is he going to do? Muhammad himself said, that means Allah's apostle, that's Muhammad, said, the hour will not be established until the son of Miriam descends among you as a just ruler. Number one on his agenda is going to break the cross. You go, why on earth would Jesus break the cross? Remember, it didn't happen according to Islam. Got it? Number two, he's going to kill the pigs. Now, some say, that, that means these, these filthy animals. No, it doesn't. That's talking about who? The Jews. They're referred to as apes, monkeys, pigs in the Quran, particularly in the latter verses. Remember Muhammad himself beheaded and supervised the beheadings of the Banu Karazai, six to nine hundred Jews. That alone, to me, disqualifies him as a prophet. He's going to kill the pigs, and then he's going to abolish the jizya, that tax that non-Muslims must pay if they want to be protected. You go, really? Really? Because remember, they believe that Esau is a Muslim, and Esau is a prophet of Islam. So is it the same Jesus? Not only is it not the same Jesus, remember, you now know it is the absolute opposite. It is the counterfeit. It is the one who denies the true Jesus. Now, I want to just quickly, it's the last thing I'm going to cover tonight. Really quick, we're going to go through this, and there's more information on this in the DVD. But I want you to understand, and I keep saying it over and over again, I can't tell you, this isn't just in interfaith churches anymore, folks. This is the predominant movement in missions. First of all, in missions, we see several groups that are promoting the idea of the common word dialogue, the idea of bridge building, the idea of Allah is Jehovah, groups like hub communities. That's frontiers. They're doing Bible studies. They're, they're encouraging Christians to do Bible studies with Muslims. Now, I don't have a problem with Muslims and Christians getting together and studying the Bible. But they're not studying the Bible. They're studying the Quran and the Bible, and they're trying to find common ground. The problem is most Christians who get into this are so uneducated about the Quran that if the Muslim says to them, hey, this is what the Quran says, they're going to believe it. Number two, we see groups like the Crescent Project or the Camel Method. These are all bridge building. Even if they bring them to the Bible, then it's a corrupted version of the Bible that has Allah in it. We see groups like uh, 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 Rick Warren's church, uh, Saddleback, uh, one of his pastors promoting a document called the Kingsway document. This goes hand in hand with the common word document, the idea of spiritual reconciliation. We see now many Arab Christians overseas who are coming to American churches and saying, we can reconcile, we can have peace. It's not possible. The Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, right, you cannot sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons at the same time. How can God have anything to do with what's evil and demonic and what denies Him? We've got to move on. How about this? Anybody heard of the insider movement? This is the predominant view that is being pushed in missions. The idea that Muslims can accept Jesus as Savior, but for a time, stay in their Muslim community, tell their family they're Muslim, go to the mosque, do their prayers, don't rock the boat, don't tell anybody, because after all, we don't want you to be unduly persecuted. You go, wow, I was a fool. Because you see, when I became a Christian, immediately I knew I'm an apostate. I've left Islam. I deserve the, according to the prophet of Islam, I deserve the death penalty. And three days into being a Christian, I was so excited about my faith that I told my parents, and my dad disowned me. 
I'm so grateful to God that my dad disowned me because on day three, God as my father became real to me. And these missionaries are going and saying, we want to make sure that Muslims aren't persecuted. Stay in for a while. Lie to your family. Now, they don't call it lying. They call it strategy. It's a great strategy. God has given us a new strategy. Here's how we're going to reach Muslims. Become a Muslim or, or, or follow Jesus. Stay as a Muslim for a while. Now, I don't have a problem if someone in a Muslim country that is in heavy persecution becomes a Christian and then goes underground. I get that. That happens in Iran all the time. They become a Christian, they got to go underground because if they don't, their family is going to probably kill them. But they go underground for a while, they get discipled, they get stronger, then they come out. They never go back and tell their family they're still a Muslim. Or, or God forbid, go do their daily prayers where they're praying in their daily prayers. Allah has no son. I talked to a missionary last, or about two weeks ago from Indonesia who's a great brother in the Lord. And he said, do you know, Sharam, the statistics are bearing out now that over 85% of these so-called converts are now going back to Islam. In the DVD, there's a documentary that I highlight called Half Devil, Half Child. Uh, a, a friend of mine who I know, he's got a ministry called I Squared. They did a documentary in Bangladesh, this documentary. And all it does is it follows the insider movement and the corrupted Bibles. And it shows you how confused these so-called converts are. We've got to move on. We're running out of time. Here's one that's even worse than the insider movement. Messianic Muslims. You go, excuse me? This is the idea that you can be both Muslim and Christian at the same time. All you got to do is just believe in Jesus. And this is not temporary. This is permanent. This is also referred to as the common path. Now, we have a one-minute video. Can we just quickly show that video as we're wrapping up here? We're almost done, folks. Please be patient. Are you ready for the audio? Tell me if you have a problem with this video. So let's say this circle represents the kingdom of God. Or in Arabic, you could say, Malakut Allah. Now, if this circle represents Christians, this circle represents Muslims, what's happened for so many years is that Christians have been telling Muslims, you've got to come over into our circle, become a Christian. That's the only way you can come into the kingdom of God. Or Muslims have been saying, hey, come over here, you've got to become a Muslim. That's how, that's how you really know God and, and are able to... Uh, move in the right direction. But really, those things aren't the issue. The real issue is how can we both move into the kingdom of God and find the straight path to God? That is the question. Any problems? Notice, first of all, he called it Malakut Allah, the King of Allah. You know, for years we've been saying this weird notion that you've got to become a Christian to come into the kingdom of heaven. But that's all wrong. Let me say this, and you know tonight, I've told you, our ministry, we're committed to speak the truth and love. You know that I don't believe in political correctness. This is not only heresy. The majority of emergent church leaders are peddling this. They are driving the argument now in the missions community. In missions, they believe in a C1 through C6 scale. C1 to C3 is accepted missional practice, meaning when you church plant in Muslim countries or in, a, or in a foreign country, you can bring some cultural elements in, but not spiritual elements. When you get into C4, C5, that's the insider movement. And when you get into C6, it's the Muslim, Messianic Muslim. This is pure heresy. And they're peddling it as new strategy. God has given us new strategy for reaching Muslims. You don't even need to become a Christian. Forget all that Christianity stuff. You can find the straight path. Well, folks, you know what Muslims pray every day in their daily prayers? Allah, show us the straight path. The exact wording. And these missionaries, so-called missionaries, come along. And I, forgive me, I'm not trying to malign. There are some amazing missionaries out there. I know missionaries who've laid their lives down. I know missionaries that are putting their lives on the line every day. I have deep respect I was a missions pastor myself for two and a half years, and I love missionaries. These aren't missionaries. This is heresy. 
they're missionaries for the wrong side. Maybe you could say it that way. This is heresy. And we've got to call it out as such. By the way, that church, that church in Tacoma, that pastor presented this kingdom circles to his leadership team. They didn't even know what it was until they came to one of my presentations and saw this video and go went, wow, that's what we were watching? You see the problem? We perish for a lack of knowledge. and We don't know the truth. The other last thing that i got to cover with you is the Bible translations. Unfortunately, this is happening more and more. Now, Wycliffe was called to the carpet on this. I know great people in Wycliffe. I'm not trying to say Wycliffe has a big job. I mean, they, they translate in many, many countries, right? But they were specifically caught. Uh, again, my friend Josh Lingle several years ago wrote an open letter because he tried to confront them. They denied they were doing it. He wrote an open letter, called them out. They still denied it. The Assemblies of God churches, 13,000 plus churches, boycotted them. Then Wycliffe paid attention. They submitted themselves to an international panel. That panel made 10 recommendations last year. The first four were on the issue of what's called contextualization. What's contextualization? They were taking the term Father, our Heavenly Father, out of the Bible and putting Allah in its place. They were taking the term Son of God out of the Bible and putting either Messiah or omitting it all together. One, because we don't want to offend Muslims. Two, because they don't understand, supposedly. Now remember, what, does, what do Muslims pray every day in their daily prayers? Allah is not a Father. Allah is not a Son. What do we do as missionaries and Bible translators? Come along and give them a Bible that proves their point. What does the Quran teach about the Bible? It's corrupt. We Christians shouldn't say that God is three, three, right? We Christians shouldn't say there's a trinity. We shouldn't say God is Father, God is Son. What do the Bible translators do? They come along and say, you're right, Muslim. You understand the, the gravity and the scope. Now, I've had people do, who come after me and say, well, you're maligning Wycliffe. No, I'm not. I'm glad they submitted to the recommendations, but to this day, they have not admitted that they were doing this. Why? If we make a mistake, let's come out and admit it. No problem. I get it. They translate many countries. But you see, the in-country missionaries are telling groups like Wycliffe, stop it. We don't need your corrupted Bibles. We can explain the gospel. We can explain to the Muslim that God is Father, God is Son. And if you were like me, that was welcome news, even though I didn't understand it at first. But I began to understand that I have a Heavenly Father. What, are we, what gospel are we giving them? But a corrupted gospel. So, I want to close here. What do we do? First of all, we've got to wake up. Now, I've, I've been saying to America for the last five years, I've been traveling around this country, wake up. My turn now is, I believe, I've got to say to the church, church, wake up. People of God, wake up. Christians, wake up. Islam is breaching this nation. Our national security, our government, our school, our medias, our churches. One, because of compromise. Two, because we've lost the watchmen on the wall. We don't have the watchmen who are, who are calling out. And today, if they call out, they're attacked. Well, doesn't that sound like the prophets of old? We must speak the truth in love. We must stop compromising God's Word. It's not an option, folks. It's not an option. We're not going to win people by a false gospel. We're not going to win people by a comfortable gospel, particularly Muslims. If they're devout, if they come from a Muslim family, they must count the cost because there's going to be rough roads ahead of them. But once they count the cost and they come into the kingdom, I promise you those Muslims will be some of the most on-fire Christians you've ever met if we give them the proper gospel and trust the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the gospel is offensive. Amen? Amen. To some, it's a cornerstone. To some, it's a stumbling block. It's not up to you and me You and me to decide who gets what. We preach it. We teach it. We live it. God decides who it will be a stumbling block to and who it will be a cornerstone to. And by the way, I will tell you this. The majority of Muslims, even if they are cultural, will be offended by the gospel as I was. But I realize. Once I became a Christian, that wasn't an offense. It was just the sword of the Spirit piercing my heart, opening my heart to the truth, where the Lord showed me, Sharam, you know one is true and one is a lie. Choose. And I chose to follow him. Praise God. He gets all the glory for it.
Pray for the fear of the Lord to fall on God's people. Why do I say that? I see a lot of fear of man in the church, folks. We need the fear of the Lord again. We need great courage. We need great boldness. And, 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 and may I even say, may I, may I venture if you don't mind. See, I talked to some house church leaders in Iran. Heinz, I talked to house church leaders in Iran who say this to me. They say, Sharam, we're praying for America. I go, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Thank you for praying for America. America needs it. I go, what are you praying for America? They said, we don't really want to tell you. I said, no, come on. You can't do that to me. What do you, please, please, really, you want to know? I really want to know. You really want to know? I really want to know. We're praying that the American church would go through persecution because we see a weak church in America. Whew. I mean, talk about being cut to the heart, right? If it's necessary, we should say, Lord, bring it. Blessed are those that are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And lastly, we must pray against the spirit of Islam. Folks, I've shown you tonight. I don't know how much more clear I can show you. This is the Antichrist spirit. This is a spirit that denies Christ in every vestige, in every verse of the Quran. Don't buy it. It's a, it's, it's a deception from hell. And we are being sucked in. Pastors who are telling me, I'm not going to ever allow you to come into my church because you talk negatively about Islam. Pastor, how can I even share my testimony if I don't talk truthfully about Islam? And please take this message back. I will come. You can take the DVDs. You can get our message online. Get on radio. Get these get whatever it takes, folks. Let's get this message out. There is no common God. There is no common word. There is no Chris Long. There is no interfaith dialogue. We serve the true and living God. And our job is to be faithful to Him. Be obedient to Him. I want to stand before Him one day. And hear those words that all of us want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. I want to be that church of Philadelphia that he says, even though you have little strength, you have not denied my name or my word. Church, that's what we need to be. There is great deception and there is persecution coming to the church in America. But we will stand because why? God preserves a remnant. Amen? God always preserves a remnant of His people that are going to stand faithfully. And lastly, please stand with Israel. May we not, I mean, I'm telling you, the mass apostasy of churches against Israel is an epidemic. The more they embrace Islam, interestingly enough, the more they get become against Israel. And I'm not talking about embracing Israeli foreign policy. I'm talking about praying for Israel and understanding the divine call of that nation, the covenant relationship that God had. I'm going to leave... Um, some resources, if it's okay, do you guys need the screen? I was going to leave some resources that are on our website. I want to leave you with this verse. Um, this is also in 1 John 2. If you didn't believe the first passage in 1 John, look at this one. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father. As for you... Will you do me a favor? Will you raise your hand with me tonight? Please? Do you want to abide in Christ? Okay? As for us, abide in Him. Abide in you which you heard from the beginning. We've heard the gospel from the beginning. The gospel has brought us into the kingdom. We will not compromise God's word. Amen? We will stand and defend our faith even unto death if necessary. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Father, in the Son, and in the Father. Amen? These are the verses that we have, or, the, or the, the resources we have on our ministry, or on our website, I should say. If you want to reach out to Muslims, if you have a church that wants to be trained to reach out to Muslims, there are great resources out there. If you know Muslims you want to reach, on my website I have a, a link to the, uh, a, a website called Muslim Journey to Hope. Great website with video testimonies from other Muslims, including a good friend of mine, Pastor Mark Loramini. Uh, if you want to support our ministry, as Heinz already said, we have information on the back table. I can't encourage you enough. Get this DVD of this presentation tonight that has more stuff on it and get it into the hands of your church, your pastors, your leaders, your Bible study, your family, your friends. It's going to be critical. And if you want us to come and speak at another church, we'd be more than happy to. Heinz, thank you for letting me go a little longer. I do, I do take five minutes, right? That little mic change, that cost me about five minutes in there, a couple of pit stops. So, <laughs> but thank you guys for your time. May the Lord bless you.
Thank you, Shram. There's a lot of information he was trying to cover, and it may have sounded like it's coming from a fire hose, <laughs> but uh, I, hope, I hope you caught much of it. Uh, we'll take time for two questions, just five minutes. But we'll Hi, yes. I, just, I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you've given today. The question that I have is, say, just for the sake of example, that we, we would take on face value that Allah just simply means Arabic for God. God. Right. Isn't okay. that an irrelevant moot point? And would you not agree that there's no real difference between the Muslims who are changing who God and Christ is and they're in the same exact camp as the missionaries for the Mormons, as the JWs knocking on your door, or anyone else who creates a different Jesus and a different God than the one named in the first and second commandments? Yes, I would agree that spiritually speaking, that any, that any source that is denying the true Christ, you could put into the category of an antichrist spirit, of an antichrist spirit. The question is, is Islam more than that? Is Islam a greater manifestation of evil? I'm not saying those aren't evil or wrong, but yet I don't see Mormons beheading people. You know, so again, I'm just saying that, that even though there is, is, there's deception, even though they're an error, but yet for Islam, there is such a different manifestation. When you see the true face of Islam, it is as demonic and as evil as you can imagine. So in that sense, um, it is different. But yet, yes, if I was reaching out to a Mormon or a JW or a Muslim, of course I would want to bring correction. But the problem is when our, the, it's like with, with Muslims, the missionaries have taken this tactic now that, well, we're having such a hard time reaching them, which is not true. That's a false statement because one in Iran today, and they're not doing it through a compromised gospel because in Iran, the Iranians, the Persians have rejected Islam because they've been under Islam for 34 years now. They've rejected it, 35 years. They've rejected it, meaning they, they've, they've seen it face value. They know what it is and they don't want it anymore. That's why in Iran, you have the lowest mosque attendance in the world at under 8%. So most young people in Iran have already rejected Islam. So when they hear the gospel, they're on fire. Some believe that the greatest revival is happening in Iran today. So the idea that these missionaries use as this tactic, that, well, because we're having a hard time reaching Muslims and seeing fruit, we've got to take this tactic. That right now, right there is the first misconception that they have because many Muslims are coming to Christ with an uncompromised gospel. My friend, Pastor Mark Lori Amini, who has a satellite ministry, 46 million Muslims, watch his program three times a week. He's getting hundreds of calls a month. They're coming to Christ. No compromise. So their strategy is not really a strategy. It's a comp it is a choice to compromise the Word of God. And maybe some do it out of good intent. doesn't matter at the end of the day if they're preaching the wrong gospel. I mean, I mean, remember Paul said, if, if, even if they were preaching out of a false motive, but if they're preaching the true gospel, God can use that. But in this case, they're preaching a false gospel and with wrong motive if they're trying to do this. So that's where I would say is the difference there is that it's, a, it's, a, it's like a greater manifestation of, of evil that we're seeing when you see the full face of Islam. One, one last question. Go for it. Uh, does it bother you like it does me when, especially on the news, you hear the term moderate Muslim? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, specifically, it actually bothers me more when I hear the word peaceful Islam. Those two words together make my skin uh, cringe. Uh, and I say this in my new presentation. Um, there is no such thing as a moderate Muslim. Now, what I mean by that is this. There are Muslims who try to be moderate. But Islam itself cannot be moderate. Does that make sense? So if a Muslim is trying to be moderate, then by definition, they're not a good Muslim. That's why ISIS goes and kills Muslims. Because when they declare that this is the pure Islam, you as a Muslim who say no, will kill you too. Because they're not seen as a good Muslim. Same thing with the ideology of Islam. 
People say there's a peaceful Islam. No. Can there be a peaceful Muslim? Sure there can. A Muslim can decide to be peaceful because they don't know their ideology. They're not following their ideology. But there's no such thing as a peaceful Islam. Because Islam is there to dominate, and their definition of peace is that everyone must be submitted to Allah and His law, which is Sharia. So I hope that answers that question. Yes, it deeply bothers me, and I hear it all over the media. I'm hearing it in our churches now. We have to reach out to moderate Muslims, moderate Islam. There is no moderate Islam. It's either true or it's, an, it's, a, it, it's falsehood. It's, it's like lukewarmness, same as the Bible. They're lukewarm Muslims, and they're going to be dealt with by their own people. Okay, so we're going to bring this to a close. And again, Sharam, thank you very much for sharing. Oh my your goodness, heart it is my us. honor. Yeah. Thank you guys for having yeah. me. Thank you for doing this. So obviously there's a lot more information that uh, we don't have time to cover here, but uh, he does have a lot of on his table back there. Take advantage of that. There's some good stuff there. And look at the other exhibit tables as well. You know, there's uh, books on uh, defending your faith on creation versus evolution, on Christian apologetics and biblical worldview. And that's why we do these forums, because we want to be able to defend what we believe. And Sh Sh Sharam has helped us to do that. So I'm going to bring this to a close. There's the tables, there's refreshments uh, in the kitchen area there as well. And as you leave, you'll notice on the back window that there's a flyer and that describes the next talk we're going to have here next month. Uh, and it's going to be by Spike Paceras. And it's going to be on debunking the Big Bang. Why the Big Bang is not good science. So let me just bring this to a close in a word of prayer. And then you'll be dismissed. Father, we just thank you for Sharam uh, Hadian and his ministry. We thank you that you saved him. Uh, that he's able to share the truth with us and with others around the, this country. 